Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our evening broadcast. Saturday Dhamma Talk. We have meditators staying with us and we have visitors. And we have an online community tuning in. Tuning in to hear the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the the Dhamma is what the Buddha taught. Dhamma. Dharma is the Sanskrit. So how do you learn the Dhamma? This might seem like an odd question. Teach us. It's a simple answer. We learn the Dhamma by reading books and listening to talks. Ah, but what do we mean by learned? By learn, you know, the word learn. Does it mean that you remember what I said? If I tell you that the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths Did you just learn anything? What did you just learn? Suppose someone now asks you, what did the Buddha teach? Well, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths Wow! You learned the Dhamma, right? There appears to be something missing there now, I could tell you what the Four Noble Truths are you could repeat that, that back to someone. Wow, you know the Four Noble Truths. Are you enlightened? Maybe, but not because of that. Well, what if you think about the Four Noble Truths and you read books that people have written, maybe even write your own books? But you understand them. You say, yes, that relates. I've had that experience. I know suffering. Yes, I've suffered. I agree. I understand. Craving, that's the cause of suffering. Mm, yes, I, I know when I crave, suffering comes from it. Or maybe you disagree. Maybe you say, no, just not true. I can like things and want things, doesn't make me suffer. But I understand the Buddha's teaching. I understand that it's wrong, you might say. Have you learned Buddhism? When you think about it and you 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 get it, right? It's logical, it's reasonable, it makes sense. When I teach, people who listen ostensibly agree or disagree with me, think about what I say and take it in. Maybe it gives them encouragement to practice. Why does it give them encouragement? Because they understand it. Because they agree with it, they think that's right, that's true. What's missing? Something's missing, right? The glaring obvious omission. It's interesting, you know, that when if you ask this question, people would say, well, read a book on Buddhism. If you want to learn Buddhism. What happens when you read a book? What 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 is what is going on? What is the actual reality of having read a book on Buddhism? There's courses on Buddhism. I've taken courses on Buddhism. I've even taught classes on Buddhism. What happened? What's the result? Not very much from a Buddhist perspective. Some good stuff, some bad stuff, but not all that impressive in any way. 
it, what I mean is that Buddhism doesn't pay much attention to this learning stuff that we're talking about. Just like Buddhism doesn't pay much attention to things like Buddhism or things in general. People, places, things, not really important. Buddhism places emphasis on reality, on the phenomenological reality. When you've studied a book, read a book about Buddhism, the most interesting thing from a Buddhist perspective is what happened to you? What was the change? Like a science experiment. Let's give the lab rat, let's give the meditator something to read and see what happens after they've read it. That's what's interesting to us. We don't let you read because we've done these experiments and we say, oh, not positive results. Extra thinking, perhaps some doubting, confusion, um, not, not much concentration and focus on reality. Meaning they don't even know what's going on in their mind. Someone who reads a book, after they've read the book, they're not more focused through the act of reading, through the, the physical act of reading, on reality. Doesn't mean you shouldn't read. But you have to acknowledge the fact that the act of reading distracts you during that time from reality. You're engaged in concepts, ideas. I mean, hey, it's good. You do have to read. I wrote a little booklet, right? Make people read it. You want to do a course, you've got to read this booklet. Or listen to a talk. Listening to talks is, of course, less violent than reading. It's more passive. But what I thought I'd do tonight, after all that, is try and do some experiential learning what we call guided meditation I've been asked before to do a guided meditation and I haven't done much guided meditation I did one once in California I was specifically asked to do it um, no, I do do the brief guided meditations, like when teaching mindfulness, I'll have. That's what I'm going to do tonight. But um, it's going to be a little more extended. So the title of my talk is Guided Meditation on the Four Noble Truths. That's what we're going to do. We've said that the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. And... We are going to learn about the Four Noble Truths, not by talking about them. I'll be talking, but I'll be guiding. That's the hope. That's the idea. So for this one, you're going to have to close your eyes. YouTube's kind of a funny platform to give a Buddhist talk because you're not supposed to be looking at me. I'm not the object of entertainment. You are. You are. You are your object. So the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. We're going to learn about the Four Noble Truths. What we're going to learn, not from watching me, but from watching you. Right? I don't know if I dare, but I'm going to dare. Because I'm daring. There. Now you can barely see me. Now you got it. Now you got it. Close your eyes. So I'm going to go through the Four Noble Truths. I'm going to go through things sequentially. But meditation isn't sequential, not like that. But we're, we're, on a, we're on a tour. This is a guided tour. This isn't quite meditation. It's just a guided tour of the meditation space. 
your mind so that you can come back and meditate now you know the meditation hall the meditation space your own mind now you can come back and visit your mind later we'll even have free gifts on the tour in the form of skills that allow you to that you can tools that you can bring back when you come again souvenirs So we start with the first noble truth. The first noble truth is suffering. Yes, the one thing nobody wants a tour of. We could skip this part of the tour, right? Let's skip right to the good stuff. Unfortunately not. It's not unfortunate, it's... Un it's undesirable it's um, disagreeable to have to take a tour through suffering we're going to do it anyway because because it's an important question why why are we suffering what what is this you know you want to learn about a problem you don't go looking somewhere else if you have a if you have a a thorn in your foot you don't go looking in your hand We have to look where the problem is. You want to understand suffering. You have to look at you want to be free from suffering. You have to understand suffering. You want to understand the problem. It's quite simple, you know. You have to study the problem. And it's a wonderful thing that when you study the problem, you 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 can, you do solve the problem. How are we doing? Eyes closed. Is this fun? Are we having fun? Mm. There's many ways you can go in meditation. You can try to calm your mind. It's what most people think of, right? If you've never done meditation before, that might be what your only idea of it. Meditation is to calm the mind, empty the mind, etc. Maybe you think we're going to have special experiences like see bright lights or leave our bodies, be able to read each other's minds, that sort of thing. Many things you can do with the mind. Many things we do do with our minds in our daily life. Nothing we do, nothing we do with our minds or with our lives, with our bodies, with ourselves None of it lasts forever None of it satisfies us, none of it None of it is really sustainable What we're going to do is just look at our experiences Look at our minds, look at our bodies Sometimes we can live our lives, some people live their lives with great happiness, great pleasure. And they wonder what all this talk is about suffering. Just by sitting here, Something that people who are very happy and very pleased and enjoy life never gen generally, generally do. People who are engaged in pleasure-seeking, you know, 
They're, they're doing that. They're not doing this. They would think this uh, boring, uninteresting. But it's quite unsettling. That when you sit here, when you just look at reality, look at yourself, not some mystical idea of reality, just you. It's quite disturbing that it's not quite the way we think it is. Pleasure isn't quite the way we think it is. Pain isn't even quite the way we think it is. Our minds are jumping here, jumping there. Our experiences are coming and going. It's like looking behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. You, you see this magical world full of marvelous, wonderful, scary dangerous things and then you look behind the curtain and you see oh it's just a machine oh it's just that I don't even know what to do with this it's just like you look under the hood of a car you've come here new if you're new on this tour you look under the hood and you say oh just an, I know that's a car engine, but I have no idea how to fix it. I can see something's broken, but I'm not a mechanic. Overwhelming. The mind can be quite overwhelming. Sitting here is not fun. Some of you have probably already switched over to Facebook. Much more fun. Go back to his other videos. They were more fun than this. Meditation, mindfulness meditation, a word that we many of you have heard. This is the tool, this is the knowledge, this is the mechanics training that allows us to look at suffering, make sense of it. Why am I suffering? Am I suffering? Am I happy? What is happiness? What's going on in my mind? We have people who thought they were happy and worry about meditation. Meditation is going to stop me from daydreaming and enjoying thinking and planning and imagining. Creativity. Is it going to stifle my creativity? Meditation is going to help you see what all these things really are. It's not going to help you let go of something that's useful and beneficial to you. But it's, it's quite interesting how when you look under the hood, things aren't quite as they seem. My car is running fine, you say, but the mechanic says, oh no, your car is about to break down. That noise is not a good noise. But I like that noise. Mmm. Like it or not like it, there's something going on under the hood. And you can like it all the way until your car breaks down, but it's going to break down. For example, not, not that I can claim that it is. You have to look under the hood to see. And it's a remarkable thing about meditation, about the mind, about mindfulness, that... Again, that's all it takes, is when you look, you do see. You see what's the problem. Another remarkable thing is that when you see the problem, well, we won't get ahead of ourselves. We'll just talk about the problem. Suffering. Yes, for most of us, this is unpleasant. We don't have to talk about this idea that life is all pleasurable and happy because for most of us it's quite easy to see if you're just an average ordinary person this is kind of unpleasant having to close your eyes and not knowing what to do kind of lost it's not really familiar so mindfulness is this tool that allows us to make this unfamiliar landscape more familiar we start with something simple, like you're in kindergarten. I'll give you a crayon and you can draw with it. 
write your name in bright pink crayon. So we give you the stomach, watch the stomach rising and falling. That's your pink crayon or orange or whatever color you want. Maybe no colors. This is the basics, the beginning, something simple. When the stomach rises, say to yourself, rising, not out loud, but in the mind, which should be with the stomach. And when the stomach falls, say falling, rising, falling. It's not because the stomach is special in any way, it's just an easy... Beginner's tool, beginner's um, object. Introduction to the art of mindfulness, if I could coin that phrase. Because it's an art, it's a skill, it's a training. You, you have to get good at it. You have to really feel it. That's not the right word. You have to become it, maybe, to be Zen about it. It's not about intellectual. People ask questions, should I be like this when I'm mindful? Should my mindfulness be like this? Should it be like that? Should I you know, work, train myself in this way? All that intellectualization doesn't work. You have to really become mindful through a lot of um, trial and error, adjustment, observations, seeing how you're doing it wrong. And by wrong just means you're doing it in a way that is creating stress. You're creating stress, creating suffering. The Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, it's all about suffering. If you're creating suffering, you're doing something wrong. But it's quite complicated. It's something that you have to practice. But our minds are quite complicated. If I ask you, in what ways are you creating suffering? Oh, it's not a simple answer. Suffering really, for our purposes, just means our minds are mixed up. There's stress. No, it's not pleasant sitting here. Why is it not pleasant sitting here? I'm not beating you over the head with the teachings. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not calling you nasty names. Hopefully there's not insects biting at you or it's not too hot or not too cold. Apart from all that, it's still unpleasant. It's still uncomfortable. Why can we not be at peace? This is suffering. The second noble truth is the cause of suffering. This is what we see when we start to observe suffering. When you look at the stomach rising and falling. When you look at your feelings and you say pain, pain, pain. When you're thinking and you say thinking, thinking. When you observe these things, you observe the suffering. When you're stressed and you say stressed, stressed. When you like something or you dislike something, you say liking, liking or disliking, disliking. You start to see what's really causing you suffering. You start to realize, hey, wait a minute. Here I thought, boy, that bad memory that I have of you know that thing that bothers me, that's suffering. This person yelling at me, oh what's suffering? The heat. It's so hot this summer, I'm suffering terribly from the heat. Too cold, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. 
constipated, diuret di diuretic. You know. I have a stomach ache. I have a back ache. I have a headache. I have a toothache. All these thoughts that keep coming back, all these memories, oh, the sadness, I've lost this, I've lost that, the burdens I have of debt, maybe I'm unhealthy, maybe I'm overweight, maybe I'm getting old, maybe I have cancer, or diabetes, or maybe I'm disabled, Maybe I'm this or that. We start to see things a little bit differently, eventually a lot differently. And in fact, it's not these experiences that are the problem. Suffering is in fact not the problem. The problem is those things that are causing suffering, which aren't actually the sufferings themselves, but our reactions to those things. It's not that you feel pain, it's that you don't like feeling pain. It's not that you're thinking about something in the past, no matter how many times it comes up. It's that you're afraid or upset or sad or even attracted to the thought that leads to a cycle of positive or negative emotions I mean at at attachments and obsessions stress chaos evil if you want to even go so far evil, you hurt other people, you hurt yourselves mm. to get what we want to get away from what we don't want to do anything which drives us further and further into this habit of reaction. If you react negatively to something, it doesn't free you of the problem. It makes you more reactionary. Ah, this is the problem. The Buddha said craving is the cause of suffering. Do I like to be a little more broad than that? He does talk about three types of craving But if you want to break it down It's really just any reaction Or any Any addition we make To reality The wonderful thing about mindfulness And the reason why it's so potent So powerful If you're sitting here with me Being mindful You can note the sound of my voice Even as hearing, hearing if you're noting the pain as pain, 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 you start to see that remarkably none of this is unpleasant, none of this is problematic. It's only when you stop being mindful and you like or dislike, bored, excited, amused, and so on, that you lose track of, of you, you lose track of this, of now. You lose touch with reality, with the natural uh, reality of experience. That's where all the problem. That's where all the stress comes from. The Buddha, out, uh, the Buddha uh, singled out craving Because it's that which drives us If you, the way, Talking about it as craving means any kind of Or thirst is maybe a better literal translation Any kind of drive you have to get rid of something to Any kind of well, reaction really We have to our experiences that's bad, how can I get rid of it? Thirst Your thirst for uh, Annihilation of things Or destruction Or escape Creates stress You don't like this That's your problem 
this is not your problem. The, the not liking it is your problem. So he's sitting here. Can you see it? Can you see likes and dislikes? Fears, aversions, boredom, sadness, wants, desires. All these things that take us away. Why can't we just sit? Why can't I just be here and now? Oh, there's so much that I want, so much that I like and dislike. Now there's ego getting in the way. So many different things. This monk doesn't know what he's talking about. Boring. Why doesn't he turn the light back on? All this stuff, that's not here, that's not now. I give you a tool, a really remarkable tool. Use the mantra to remind yourself, this is this, it is what it is. Pain is pain, thoughts are thoughts, emotions are emotions, the body is the body. Watch the stomach, it's an easy one. Just say rising, falling, put your hand on your stomach even. Not only will you see these things that, cause, that we call suffering, but You'll see what's making them suffering. It's only our likes and dislikes of them. Our partialities and our reaction. Take a look at them and you'll see, oh yes, that thing I thought was so pleasant. The state of finding it pleasant, right? The state of finding it pleasant is actually stressful. It's coarse. It's less peaceful than, than just being content. How do you have it? How do you make it so that you never ever don't get what you want? How do you make it so that you always get what you want? The only way is to never want anything. And it seems kind of like a trick. But in reality, it is actually the, the solution. You want to be happy? Don't ever want anything. Don't take my word for it. You can see it now for yourselves. Take a look, it's right here. So if, you've pra if you're practicing along, we'll move on to the third noble truth. This is the cessation of suffering, and really it's talking about something called Nibbana, which technically, or, or no, uh, dogmatically, refers to this moment where you let go of everything. And I say dogmatically because we're going, to, it's not in a bad way, but we're going to broaden the definition a little bit and point out that even here and now you can you can get an idea of what this is like by letting go of little things. Just here and now, and you say to yourself, pain, pain, and you find yourself letting go of the pain. Maybe you're bored of what, what you're hearing and you're kind of annoyed that I keep talking and don't let you meditate. Focus on the sound of my voice and say hearing, hearing. And you you let go of the judgment, the likes, the dislikes. Focus on the likes and dislikes, say liking, liking, and you say, oh, look at that, it's just disappeared. If you're bored, what's the best way to overcome boredom? It sounds awful, but you just actually just say to yourself, bored, bored. If you can do it without judgment, instead of like reaffirming it, this is terrible, bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. That's not mindfulness. But if you say it objectively, bored, bored, trying to see that, yes, indeed, this is boredom, instead of judging it. Poof. It's magic. 
You know, people who have anxiety and then try this and say, "Oh, I'm not anxious." If you've ever had butterflies in your stomach, you have to do something that you normally be so anxious about. It's kind of funny to feel, and your body is still shaking and butterflies still in your stomach, but your mind is like totally at peace, and you realize that wasn't it. All of that wasn't it. it wasn't the problem. The problem was totally in my mind my reaction to all these things that's the cessation of suffering nibbana nibbana is no, it's remarkable i mean it's not that it doesn't exist it's it's or that it's even different it's quite different but all of these things are hooks in us nibbana is just the natural result of freeing yourself from all the hooks you 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 get free that's the cessation of suffering do this enough yeah you'll get there simple right sounds simple i mean it should seem a lot simpler now that you're actually hopefully doing it it's not some complex theory that you have to study in books. Just start to look at things as they are. Start to see, make sense of your own mind. So finally we come to the fourth noble truth. Again, these aren't sequential, this is just a tour. The fourth is really what we've been doing, hopefully. When you say to yourself, pain, pain, or so on, you're cultivating the, the fourth truth, which is the path. So you've already been doing it. But we'll break it down, because the Buddha actually said the path is composed of eight parts. And they're important. It's important to cover all eight bases. Again, not in sequential order, but... They are, they are factors, so as a tour we'll go through them all. Not quite as you would do in meditation. The first one is right view. As a meditator you develop right view. I mean the most remarkable part for a beginner is just seeing what's there. Realizing it's not what we thought. It's not how we thought, and we didn't really even think. A lot of wrong view is just no view. <laughs> Sorry, no view in the sense of being blind. If you ask people, what do you think about your mind? What is your theory of your mind? They might give you a half-baked answer, but many people I don't, don't even think about such things. Or they accept the views of others. They accept what scientists will tell you or religious leaders will tell you. Right view means you actually start to see See the Four Noble Truths The Fourth Noble Truth starts with seeing the Four Noble Truths We could say starts with seeing the First Noble Truth And uh, as a result letting go of the Second Noble Truth Seeing that the things that we hold on to Are not worth holding on to the things that we get upset about are not get worth getting upset about. Suffering only comes from clinging. It only comes from craving. From reaction. So when you look, when you gain right view, meaning just seeing things, seeing what's going on, while accompanying this is also right thought You can put these in order, there is a way to do that Because right view does lead to right thought But it's more complicated, it's, it's not something you should stick to But for the tour's purposes it's useful When you have right view there's right thought Right thought just means, or the right intention But your right mental activity, your mind starts to get right you no longer want to kill people, or steal, or lie, or cheat. You, you no longer get angry. 
you know, anger is reduced, greed is reduced, delusion is reduced, bad thoughts are reduced, chaos, mind states that stress you are reduced, purified. Just saying to yourself, pain, pain, or seeing, seeing, or thinking, thinking. Just watching the stomach rising and falling. This is the, the, the thoughts here, the thoughts that arise or that you cultivate from this are thoughts of clarity, thoughts of purity. You start to think objectively. Um, live objectively Observe and interact with the world objectively It's not devoid of It's not missing something It's, it's, very, it's much more real Vibrant and alive Than living in your mind With your worries and your fears And your doubts and your addictions your desires, your ambitions, and so on. Even your wants and desires, the stuff that we say is good. The act of wanting and desiring, again, it's not real. It's not in touch with reality. It's not here, it's not now. It's all up in our heads, in our minds. So you're, you, you should be seeing your thoughts now. Oh, these thoughts are stressful. These thoughts are... These thoughts are peaceful. Work that all out. You'll start to gain right thought or right intention, right mental activity. Along with this comes three more things. All the next three, speech, action, livelihood. We can lump these all together and talk about them in terms of how pure is this state. People don't realize about meditation is that it's not a, it can't be a hobby, something you do on the side. You want meditation to be valuable, beneficial. It's a change in who you are. And so it requires it requires something we call morality. It's it's quite opposite or in opposition to things like killing and stealing and lying and cheating it's even in opposition to talking too much another thing another part of this that we don't realize is that throughout our lives our daily lives we're constantly doing and saying things that mess us up you know, we say things we regret. Maybe we even say good things, but then we feel doubt and self-conscious. And did I really say the right thing? It's even possible to feel bad about doing the right thing, about something that was objectively good because of our minds. When your minds are not screwed up, when your minds are more more ordered and more clear, your actions and your speech become more clear. But what I mean to say is that when we're talking a lot, acting a lot, especially with minds that are not yet pure, we're far, from, we're quite, quite likely to have wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood. wrong activities so I, the question might come up well right speech but I'm not even talking how can it be right speech it's the best speech what it means is that there's no bad speech 
it's, it's right by omission, meaning it's completely pure. That aspect of who you are is beautiful. There can be no badness coming from it. It means you're not being bombarded by these guilty feelings of having said something wrong. The stressful feelings of, th of talking too much you know, and, and getting worked up over your speech. Even the mental fatigue of having to think of things to say or a distraction from, again, talking a lot. Actions. And doing no actions, just sitting still. This isn't theoretical, this is psychological. This, the, 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 the very real results of not saying or doing anything, or you know, very little, are profound. Why is meditation always done sitting still? Try sitting still. Very difficult. It's not only difficult, it's profound. It's so pure. It's so now and here and real. Very difficult. But quite profound. Right livelihood, well, that just goes along with the other two. That being said, Good to point uh, to, to to reiterate that this is this is life. It's not. I'm not trying to say that you're totally absolved from all the bad things you do in life, just because you come and purify here and now. In 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 this session, they have to go hand in hand. It has to be a life. It has to be a part of who you are. You want to become free from suffering. Most important is that you can see. And you can see how uh, how important things like speech, how effective, how how efficacious they are. They bring results. You say things do things, there's a power to them, there's a result there. Psychological, you know, it changes your mind, affects your mind. At this moment when we're not saying or doing anything, there's, there's a very important, it's a very important part of our meditation. It's a great power that comes from that keeping us focused, keeping us present. And the last three, we've gone through five. And the next one is effort. Effort. We sit here quietly. We're not running around, we're not striving for worldly gains. It's not much like business or commerce or, or technology or whatever. Employment in the world. Where's the effort? Try watching your stomach, say to yourself, rising, falling. Try saying pain, pain, or thinking, thinking. Hearing, hearing when you hear my voice. The challenge there and the intricacy involved that you have to kind of be on a knife's edge to balance, the perfect balance of just being here, which takes skill. That's effort. The attempt the interest, the inclination to know that your stomach is rising and just know that your stomach is rising takes effort doesn't mean you have to push, push really hard 
It's a finely tuned instrument and tuning it takes effort. Right, mindfulness, well, that's what we're doing. That's the saying to yourself, hearing, hearing, seeing, seeing. The grasping of the object just as it is. You use effort, but you use effort to gain mindfulness. When you're mindful, you just see things as they are. Pain is pain, thinking is thinking, liking is liking, disliking is disliking. That's it, that's all. Mindful. It's not a great translation, it's not bad, but mindfulness means reminding yourself or remembering. Reminding yourself so that you remember, oh yeah, this is this, nothing more, nothing less. Try that, right? That's what we're trying right now. You feel pain, say to yourself, pain. You have thoughts, say thinking. You feel happy as well, say happy, happy. Learn to see things as they are. That's mindfulness and effort and all these things. The right view, right thought, and so on. And the final one is concentration, really the important outcome. Not that you're just so focused that you don't get distracted, but that you're focused on reality, that your, your focus actually shifts from all sorts of mental activity and thoughts and stuff, concepts, to experience, to being here and now. I'm sitting, sitting is sitting, it's here, it's real. Pain is pain, thoughts are thoughts, likes are likes, dislikes are dislikes, and so on. It's this concentration, or the focus may be a better translation. A balanced mind, a mind that is in perfect tune, in tune with reality. It's that mind that is going to slip through, slip out, free itself from, from suffering, from all the barbs, all the hooks that pull us here and there. The hooks are those things that allow other people to hurt us, things to hurt us, makes us vulnerable. Take out those hooks, you're invincible. The world cannot harm you. And that's the fourth noble truth. That's all four noble truths. That concludes our tour. This isn't meditation quite, so hopefully you are doing some meditation there, but it's a tour. You take this as sort of a guide of the, again, the outline, the, the space, the realm of meditation, and, and, and the direction. Your meditation is, um, is encouraged to go. So it's a little guidance, a guided tour. Well, thank you all for tuning in. I guess I won't turn the light on, I'll just transition back to this nice photo of, of, a, of a big brick thing. Alright, thank you all for tuning in, have a good night.